Good evening. Is this working? I don't really need a microphone. I'm well versed in Yeah! Turn away from the back. <laughs> I think they're on. I think they're on. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right, uh, before we begin, I'd like to tell you, uh, I put my shoulder out signing books last night, so, you know, if I seem a little retarded, <laughs> it's nothing to do with the <laughs> Come on, guys, let's give another hand for John. I like, I like it when I can see faces. It, for me, this is like a gig, you know? So, hello. Hello. <laughs> so we're starting here, we're in a bookstore, and you, you open the book, you talk about how much books meant to you, you talk about your love of the library, um, your time as a child in the library, and how much you, you almost would want to live perhaps, if you were given the chance in a library. So I want yeah. to talk about some of your favorite books. You've just written your second book. Uh, what are some of the things, what are some of the books that you look to? What are the books that give you power? Well, I've put out three books. Uh, well, that's good. No Irish, No Blacks, No Dogs, which I loved. <laughs> But uh, I felt it, it wasn't quite finished and I wasn't quite crafting what I really wanted to get to. I think this book, Anger is an Energy, definitely gets there. It's more conversational. It sounds like me on the page. That was very, very important. And in between that, I put out a book called Scrapbook, which was a very, very limited edition. Uh, and that was a sheer work of joy, love, and, and a respect for the art of putting a book together. That, I think, was my finest achievement. Um, yeah, I love books, I do. This looks like some of my house here. <laughs> I, that's, that's how it is with me. And the other side is a wall of vinyl. I love music. <laughs> and uh, I don't limit myself in my reading or my music. If it's made by human beings, I want a piece of it. I even love techno, which is not made by human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so take us through some of that collection. What, what books are on your wall? I what? couldn't do that. I couldn't even begin to tell you. It's everything, even anything written by Winston Churchill I always found fascinating. You wouldn't technically call that a novel. Uh, um, Ed, everything, everything in annuals. Uh, Samuel Pepys' diary comes to mind. I loved that when I was young. Uh, we, we talked earlier at Ulysses. That's one of my favourite books ever. It's almost completely unreadable. <laughs> <laughs> But that's, it, that's a very excellent conversation there that he's having with himself and that feels to me like that, that's what goes on in my head. When asked uh, who could I compare myself with, I, I always used to say Robin Williams, you know that, that free form all over the gaff. That's how it is in my head. Uh, a lot of that's to do with childhood illnesses. I, I'm just so glad to be alive. Yeah. I'd love, you do, you talk, you talk at length in the book and it's absolutely fascinating. If you tell us a little bit about your childhood illness, about what that meant to you and how it, how it affected your life and you as a reader. But that would spoil it for you lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's early on, it's early on. Um, I could read and write uh, at four. My mum made sure of that. I was fascinated by the shapes of letters and, and to see adults gawping into newspapers. Like, that was a fascinating world I wanted to be a part of. Uh, so I learned. I went to school and it was a Catholic school run by priests and nuns and because I was left-handed I was viewed as the devil. <laughs> Left-handed was a sign of the devil to Catholics way back then. So I was tortured, really, from five to seven for being ahead of the game. Then at seven, I got meningitis, uh, very, very serious. Uh, rushed to hospital, slipped into a coma that lasted a few months. When I came out of that coma, I had no memory of anything or anyone. Completely brain wiped. It took me something like four years to fully recover and find myself. 
but that was an exciting four years and because of that I am here today so thank you for that illness <laughs> Thank you for that illness is one way to look it, at it. It taught me honesty. It, uh, it, it's where I learned integrity. I, I depended so much on what adults were telling me to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but. I did not know these were my parents that took me out of the hospital. I was in for a year. And I had to believe that that was the case. So even though in, inside I felt mm, I was being sold or something, it's... It's remarkable when you, um, you, you're able to look at yourself from the outside in and still not know who you are, but you know you're something. You know you must belong to someone, somehow, somewhere. And when the bits of memory slowly come back, uh, they're not instantly rewarding. They're damn well upsetting because of the pain and hurt that you feel that you've inflicted on your parents forget, for forgetting who they are. Um, the term anger is an energy, yes, it, it's a, it, from a well-known pill song called Rise, but the term goes back to this illness. The doctors recommended to my parents that they keep me angry. They don't mollycoddle me, because this would spur my memories. Uh, it was, that was painful, but that anger did bring back something of them. And then slowly but surely I recovered myself. So yeah, anger is an energy to me. It's nothing to do with violence and all that nonsense. This is a purely personal journey. And you do, you talk about, you talk about honesty and integrity. And, uh, and when you read this book, you guys will see, I mean, this book moves, this book has flow, this book, it's like reading a, a great story, a great storyteller as well. And so we're talking about anger as energy and we're talking about honesty and integrity, but we're also talking hey, about- fucking cunts. <laughs> <laughs> we're also talking about memory. Yeah, tell it like it is, yeah. bastards. <laughs> you don't mind if I take a swig, I really need to put the pain down. But yeah, so that there's that anger and there's that energy and it's right there on the page. Um, you, you created this thing. It's also a collaboration and you talk a lot about art and collaboration, what it means to work with other people. And what is... I work very closely with uh, my band or anything I'm in at all. I, I like it to be a friends only zone. I put friends above any music ability ever and, and I think it works best that way. Um, I've had many managers for instance but here's the best. Look, this is Rambo. Say hello. <laughs> Woo! Rambo! We've known each other since about 11. Uh, there's no lie I could ever possibly get past him. <laughs> and uh, John is even more so determined than me not to tell a lie. It, that's how it should be. It took a long time for us to twig that, didn't it, John? You yes. just wanted to knock heads. <laughs> yeah, we did. You know? <laughs> but talk about that. It's, it's good to work with friends. That My band, Pill. Now, it, it's all the outfits I've been in. There was always animosities and, and personal conflicts. But now, Pill is, is in that special place. So... Mm. Talking with friends. Very most excellent journey because now Pill is uh, this is uh, this is the proper church, the Church of Humanity. So uh, anyone been to a Pill gig? <laughs> I'm skipping ahead. I hear there might be a new album. We'll be touring in October and November. Please come. And I, I'd like to tell you that while putting this book together, which we worked real hard on getting, getting right and perfect, we were also working on an album, a new Pill album. Uh, that's going to be called What the World Needs Now, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> the book. You, you worked very hard on it. You worked with all these other people and you're, you're going through these memories. Yep. How do you dip into it? How do you dive? You, you talk, it's a self, it's, yep. you are analyzing yourself. It's More so than, if, if you don't mind me saying, your, your other book in 93, this seems like a self-examination. Yeah, this, this is much, much deeper. That, that, that first book, uh, was, you know, I uh, thank the Zimmermans very, very much. They're very close friends and they help me no end. But this is a far deeper journey. 
I never ever touched on, a, on my childhood in, in the first book. In fact, I never thought I'd ever talk about that side at all and, and the agony of that. There's not much ecstasy in it, it's just all pain. That, that, that losing yourself in that way, very, very hard. <laughs> but needed to be dealt with and uh, if you you know and I read it so many people saying so many stupid ridiculous things about me it's like you know you cunts now read this and fuck off <laughs> Was that the first title? This is what... <laughs> <laughs> the publisher wouldn't let you get with it. This is why I can't lie. I depend on every single one of you as human beings to tell me the truth, and I hope you expect that from me. What I want to see us do is to get back into the Garden of Eden and kick the fucking snakes out. <laughs> Your parents. It, it is true to say the snakes are very comfortable in Eden, aren't they? Mm. Do you feel that way about how things are in America right now? I, I don't think we're ever going to find uh, the utopian dream I have. Not really. But you know what? If there's enough of us, we can live without the fucks. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> the, uh, the idea of art, another thing that a, 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 th a through thread that I found in your book was fashion mm. and I was absolutely fascinated so much so even yeah. the acknowledgments you actually thank Japanese fashion designers yep so I was wondering if you wanted to I mean right now in a hell of a get up if you wanted to talk a little bit about fashion <laughs> Johnny is currently wearing chef Ramsay <laughs> and there's a reason for that it's uh yeah, I mean, I've been decked out in uh, me, Issey Miyake is one of my favourites. Comme gut time de garçon, all of this stuff. I love clothes well made. That's most excellent. That, I think that's a seriously interesting part of art, to see the human form looking at its best. Because, frankly, I mean, can you imagine us lot naked right now? <laughs> you, you know, little to the imagination, it kills the imagination. <laughs> I'm wearing this because it's comfortable <laughs> uh, and we were on the way to an interview and I seen, I seen the store and it said uniforms going cheap <laughs> not joking $30 <laughs> The cheapest it's outfit in so New York. so fucking comfortable. <laughs> I always thought, when I watch these chef programs, and there's an awful lot of them out there, isn't there? Yeah. You know, how, how do they cope with the, the hot, cold, environmental changes? Very well, I can tell you right now. But you were talking, I mean, we're talking about... Uh, uh. Safety pins, clothes, like, for, for the longest time, fashion has been a through line. <laughs> Uh, and I, bourbon. I had one come out the rear at the same time. <laughs> Don't worry, the Strand actually has a hundred of these seats. Safety pins didn't start out as a fashion statement. Safety pins were there because my clothes are falling apart. I was piss fucking poor. And I liked the way it looked and I started adding to that and very soon it became like chain mail to me. You know, and that's it. It, it. Most things in my life are there because it is a practical sensibility. You know, it's like uh, Nora and me, we, we're not ones for the Lamborghinis or the fast cars or any of that like. So we went for a Volvo. <laughs> but you, you do. But it's a souped up Volvo. <laughs> you also have a boat. You love the ocean. Love the ocean. Love it. It's one of the greatest things of uh, moving to America, moving to California. It's how cheap the boats were compared to what they cost in Europe. And we've never looked back. This is one of the most wonderful things we can do when we're not happy with each other. <laughs> is get on a boat, row all the way until you leave the harbour. And then once you're outside of land, there ain't nothing more to row about. All the problems are gone. And that's how the sea works for me. And for everything to do with the sea is fascinating for me. It's, um, that's why I did those nature programs where, on great white sharks and things. Um, one of the things I think I would have done when I was young, if it wasn't be a singer in a pop band, <laughs> would have been marine biology. 
I so love it. And you, you combine that with the film Jaws and... <laughs> Professor Lydon. You know, yeah. <laughs> There's an interesting thing. Like, uh, we did a sharks thing. How long ago was that now, John? A couple of years. A long while back, right? <laughs> uh, but that's how we got our diving license, was uh, uh, free swimming in... in uh, Aqualung, etc., off the South African coast, uh, in order to get into cages and do a documentary. I know it's asked backways, but <laughs> no, look at us. <laughs> Fucking great fun. But we came up with um, these diving outfits of uh, just intensely glaring and uh, um, dangerous patterns at the time. I was a bumblebee in yellow and black and <laughs> why would you describe your colours, Johnny? Yellow and blue, stripes, parcels of white colours with red copies. My cod piece was yellow. I didn't want <laughs> nothing to make a mistake about where the genitalia were. <laughs> <laughs> but now, listen, and now, just recently, science has declared that uh, those, those stripes uh, uh, have a, a very positive uh, defense against sharks. Well, hello, John and John were doing this way back when. But then it, it shouldn't be news to you that anything I get involved with, that one way or another, ends up being copied. And I think it's true to say, and it's not because I'm an awkward fuck, it's I really haven't been copying anyone at all, have I, ever? No. no. You know? When you lose your memory, you find your memory, you find your family, you come back to yourself, you never, ever, ever want to be anybody else for the rest of your life. And that's why meningitis was a blessing. So you if you clap longer, I can get away with saying less. <laughs> <laughs> you do. You take this, uh, this unique, and, and you see this in the book. You take all of this uniqueness and you take it into, uh, into making these documentaries. You made one, you made two in Africa. Yep. And also in acting. The gorillas this, was fantastic. The apes climb up and down mountains and I'm not fit, believe me. I mean, I'm fit for life, singing. That's a different kind of energy and, and, and physical requirement. Deep lungs. Uh, I'm a very, very, very good swimmer. I can hold my breath for an awful long time. But I cannot march up and down 17 kilometers of jungle and, and hilly terrain. And I'm absolutely fucking sad sack at that. But you did and, it. And the crew that we went with, it was four girls on it. Oh, my God, the embarrassment of them running past me. <laughs> <laughs> it took two days before, like, uh, I had to... F really like find the inner stamina and I think that that was because I was so interested in meeting gorillas I was the idea was challenging at first I didn't know what I was going to do when I met the fluffy teddy bears <laughs> but once you do it's the most amazing thing to look into their eyes and not in a challenging way because you'll regret that when your head gets pulled off <laughs> but absolutely innocently and they look the same way back at you and when they come up and they touch the coloured stripes in your hair like that, that is the gentlest thing. How dare people kill these wonderful creatures. Amen. Yeah. Loved it. I've done things on insects, uh, it's a whole series. Uh, Ten. Really. Yeah. Loved it. Um, Insects always occurred to me to be kind of awkward and difficult. I never studied them too well until we did this uh, this series, um, and it was amazing. It was just beautiful to see these these lovely things that I don't know what gives them the pulse of life, but it utterly fascinates me. Leave them alone; they'll leave you alone. If you go into jungles and, he, and these these deserts and these dangerous places you won't get bitten if you behave sensible don't put your raw backside on a fire ants nest <laughs> you know be careful it's their world be kind to them and they're not really interested in you we're not ham sandwiches to them you talked about no vegetarian roles for <laughs> <laughs> vegetarians in the audience. Mm, you I talked know. about Nora. 
You have two chapters in the book dedicated to her, where you talk about her. And you also talked about moving to America. I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit oh, about those counting? things. Oh, who's counting? That's the love of my life, you know what I mean? She deserves it, and, it, and, and frankly, that's not enough. Aww. No, no, it's not. T tell, tell us a little bit, you guys meeting, all well, Who that. else would put up with me that closely? <laughs> I've never been one for the groupie scene or running around and, and, uh, or any of that at all. In fact, I don't, I don't trust people. I don't let them that close to me. But Nora was something different in my life. You know, she stood out as being a complete individual and I had nothing but, well, actually the truth is the first time we met, we had the most vile argument that it just, it, <laughs> oh yeah. Tell it, us. It, Tell us about that. <laughs> oh. She'd heard all these rumours spread about me and believed them. And uh, I wanted her to believe them and we ended up the best of friends. <laughs> all these years later. Is there anything wrong with living with the same person for 35 years? No. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's not 75 years. Oh, come on! You know I mean it. I mean it. But we are, we're here in New York. We're here I in mean it. And that's the difference, you see. I really mean it. Yeah. I mean, it shows throughout your guys' story. I mean, that's a romance. That's, I mean, there's... there's I the always thought it would show in the music. And I think the books go hand in glove with the music. It's all part of the same life's experience. And I'm trying to be as open and honest as I possibly can with you. Because in, in that, I'm finding things out about myself. How does and, and in no corny way, what a great journey life is. I mean, that is, that's how this reads. It's an epic tale. It's, a, it's an epic, non-stop, breakneck, going, 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 with some really great, great, uh, what's the word I could use? Phrases? I, I tell you, you have great it's phrases. what Hemingway should have been. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hell of a quote. Put that blurb on the cover of the paperback. <laughs> So, but you moved to, uh, you did, you moved to New York and then you moved to California. I would love to, like, here you are. Well, we were banned, we were banned all over Europe, you know. Some of the songs, you know, had anti-religious sentiments. Other songs were, uh, were very political in, in their stance. Uh, uh, other things attacked institutions. You know, as you do, like. Uh... I mean, when, when it was discussed openly in the Houses of Parliament under the Traitors and Treasons Act, right, this is for God Save the Queen and Anarchy, that charge, if pulled through, carried a death penalty, all right? So you fucking tell me who's king of the punks. <laughs> There's better. The point is, I wanted that to happen. I wanted to challenge the law, to question, are they really democratic? And they had to say yes and agree that I had every right to say what I say. And that was a worthy challenge, and that's how you beat institutions. You use their own weapons against them. And you do not need guns and bullets to do it. Peace. It was a hefty, it was a hefty charge though, and you do go into it, and what it meant to perform, and what it meant to, to carry that weight. What was that? What did that feel like? Well, you'll have to read the book for that. Ah, they bought the book, John. It's already sold. I want them to read <laughs> it. Oh, fuck yeah, they will. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're going to read this goddamn book. <laughs> there you go. Raise your hand if you're not. <laughs> oh, you're just asking where the toilet is. <laughs> so coming, I mean, you, you did. You spent a few years here in New York. And then yeah, you said, did, fuck it. I? Tell all these New Yorkers about uh, that. I, I got fucking bored with it here, you know. Really quite pretentious. I didn't realize just how old all the musicians were here compared to me. It really, it felt like a geriatrics ball. <laughs> And, 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 and I've got no ageist thing in me. The, the problem was that they were all espousing rimble poetry and, and being awfully smart ass about it. And that really pissed me off, because there's a hell of a lot better in poetry than that. <laughs> 
you know, I mean, I come from Shakespeare to, 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 to that dodgy fuck. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unacceptable. <laughs> so, I loaded up the truck and I moved to Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> Which you did, you didn't, lo you weren't sold on that immediately. I was not sold on California at all at first, uh, until I thought, well, that's the most ridiculous place for me to be. <laughs> Sometimes in life you'll find that you'll do things for mad whack inexplicable reasons that there's something inside you instinctively that, that, that te tells you that's the place you need to be. And I love California. It's open, open-minded. There's, there's not much hate for me there. There's a few people I hate there. <laughs> In the nicest possible way, as Bette Midler would say. <laughs> but you did, you must have found something you loved in Los Angeles, because it was, it was low, beach, it was the empty. The beach, the beach, the beach. Comes the back ocean, to the ocean. The ocean, the ocean, the ocean. That, that is the, the absolute soul cleansing part of it. Love it. Love the ocean. You also, there's I'll probably die in the ocean. <laughs> That's a hell of a prediction. I'll dye it red first. <laughs> <laughs> you found acting as well. B many different forms. You Did enjoy I? having a camera. You t well, we're talking about I've art forms. You, you, you're I've a writer. You're wait, a musician. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's get this right. I've, I've become accustomed to cameras on me. There, there, there's several reasons. One of them being, uh, um, I was always shy. Even You wouldn't believe this, but it's true. Even in the Sex Pistols and Early Pill, I, I, I couldn't bear cameras being on me. I was really self-conscious about it. And I think it altered my, my perspective on what it was I was doing until uh, um, I committed to a program called I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. <laughs> and that was cameras on me for 24 hours of every day, non-stop, seven days a week. There ain't nothing like that to like knock the fear out of you. I did good on that show. I raised uh, a quarter of a million pounds for quite a few charities and did not pocket not one penny of it. <laughs> Apart from personal expenses. <laughs> uh, but I, I had to walk out of that show, which is, again caused a major contention in Britain because um, they'd promised me that when my wife, she was arriving a week later for all kinds of different reasons in Australia and she was going to wait for me when I came out and the show promised me that they would tell me that she arrived safely and once I was in the jungle doing this show uh, they refused to do that. Now whatever reasons of entertainment and security they had in mind they had to understand that Nora and me were booked on the Lockerbie Pan Am flight years ago. All right? That's, that's pretty upsetting stuff to be fucking about with us on that. It's vitally important to us and our connection, and with all my friends, but in particular with my loved one, that we know that we arrived safely at all times. And if, if the wonderful world of TV uh, reality really needs to play with your mind in that way, then I think we could do without reality TV, beginning with the Cardassians. <laughs> Oh, this is really helping my shoulder. Yeah, is it feeling good? Oh, thank you for sharing that with me. Yeah. <laughs> but so through all these things, through you have the documentaries, you have the writing, you have the music. It's a constant search for truth. For my for mind, I, I think I've been an incredibly lazy bugger. But it seems to me my favourite position is flat out on a couch in front of a 60-inch TV screen. I will watch anything, so long as it's on TV. One of the major attractions I had when I first moved to New York was how many endless channels of rubbish you had. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. All those reruns and stuff that you were probably all brought up on, they were all new and exciting to me. And they still are. I'll, I'll watch the same old garbage over and over again sometimes. Um, what I've yet to do is furniture design. 
Ah. I have to come up with a bed couch ensemble with a, a toilet in the middle. <laughs> so I never have to move ever again. <laughs> You could just stay laid out and well, move even, right down. Even gigs, you could just wheel me out on stage. <laughs> Falling <laughs> in love again. <laughs> I'm going to hold you. I love the idea of incontinent pants. Like <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us back to the fact that you have. If, if any way I can get the message out to Issy Miyaki, please make Johnny a pair of incontinent pants. <laughs> And you know I'll make them fashionable. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to see that? Adults walking around the Lower East Side in nappies. <laughs> you don't know how many do. <laughs> Some might. <laughs> but I'm gonna I like the show. idea. Where, where I don't think the reality would work, but I like the idea. <laughs> I do. Reality might smell like shit. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, we all do anyway, don't we? I mean, this room's just full of farts right now. <laughs> Isn't it? You're all letting out silent but deadlies. Raise your hand if you farted since this interview began. Hey! <laughs> I'm gonna hold you to it though. Where do you find I'm the doing most one truth? right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, what, uh, no, I, I, I don't laugh at that. I mean, that's a, a perfectly normal bodily function. And <laughs> at, at Samuel Pepys always mentioned this kind of thing, see? It's, it's, it's perfectly acceptable. Vile in uh, polite company. Who the fuck's polite anymore? Me, my favourite foods, Brussels sprouts. I'm not joking, I, I absolutely love them. Which leads to the farts. I love cabbage too. The <laughs> same I thing. do, but cabbage is a dangerous one, I found. Once when I had a, I had really bad pneumonia, and one lung had collapsed, and uh, uh, Nora was away, so a friend came over, and he brought a cabbage, and he undercooked it. Now, there is nothing worse than windage with one lung <laughs> ill functioning right there you go that was a near life experience <laughs> life changing the only thing that saved me was I suppose the butter <laughs> and I love butter because of that and I ended up doing a commercial for butter you did country time <laughs> but so that, that does it. wait wait let's right. let's get into it and what did <laughs> And what did this butter commercial do? Well, it improved the uh, British economy of dairy product by 87%. So, hello. I gave people jobs by declaring butter to be a food source. And you do. This is true. You do this. You do this. You use your personality. You use your celebrity, and you use it for good. And you use it to talk about sharks or to apes or ten segments on yeah. insects. Well, even, but this is all art. Yeah. Yes, it, and it, writing is art. It's and living art. I've always been very, very wary of the word art because there's so many artists out there that really begin with a capital F. <laughs> <laughs> To tell it honestly and like it is, I think is probably the research in my mind is telling me what a true artist does. I haven't been on this planet long enough yet to be a true artist, but I am working on it. Mm. What's your excuse? <laughs> Butter. <laughs> it did good. Look at public image, right? Yep. I mean, there's, there's so many members that have come through our doors, and every one of them, no, doesn't matter how much they would bad mouth us or for being there at their particular time, or even praise us for that. That's something like 40 plus people who launched a career in music that would never have had an opportunity but for. Now that, that's an expensive university of fine art I'm running. <laughs> and in that is, there's the collaboration and there's it the is. truth. And that's what butter supplies. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you got at the truth with this book? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. But the story's not ended yet. It can't, it can't not until the day I die. And, and hopefully that's an awful long time away. I'm, yeah. you know. And I'm, I'm viewing myself as, well, I'm closer to 60 than anything else, and that's fucking great. I, uh, fuck off, Mr. Townsend, good friend of mine. <laughs> Except for the paedophilia uh, uh, accusations. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't hope I die before I get old. I want to get old, and I want that a lot. I want every single second that is available for my body to exist, to exist. All right? This is all I know, life. Well, thank you so much, guys. Come on, let's give it up. I speak for everyone in this room when I say we hope you keep creating art and you keep living life and you keep writing and you keep making music. Thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, John Mighty, come on, come on. May the road rise with you and your enemies be behind you. May they scatter, flutter, butter and a shutter.